morning, everyone, and welcome to FIU. Uh, my name is Jorge Duani. I'm the director of the Cuban Research Institute, which uh, organized today's uh, lecture, titled Operation Pedro Pan and the Cuban Children's Program, a History by Victor Destriay. Before I introduce the speaker, let me recognize the co-sponsorship of Barry University and the Florida Humanities Council, which helped to fund tonight's event with a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in particular, I want to recognize Dr. Beatriz Calvo Peña, who uh, was really the one who initiated this series of programs. There are um, handouts out there. There's still a couple of, I think, one more event no? at Barry University. If you're interested, uh, it's been going on for a month now, and I know it's been hectic for Beatriz and our staff. Um, and I also want to recognize Jimena, what is Jimena? Jimena Valdivia, no? Yes. Yes. The manager of the university archives and special collections of Barry, which includes the Operation Pedro Pan collection. And if you haven't visited, it really is uh, worth a, a visit. So I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Many of you know him and his work, Dr. Victor Andres Triay. He's a professor of history at Middlesex Community College in Middletown, Connecticut. He's also been a visiting scholar twice, not just once, twice. but twice, so two summers at the Cuban Research Institute, where he conducted interviews with more than 100 uh, members, veterans of the Brigada 2506, the uh, participants in the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Operation Federal Fund Group, whose current president, uh, Carmen Romagnac, is here, and welcome. Oh, okay. Okay, so you have to update the, the website. Anyway, welcome to your... And I know that there's a lot of, of, of Pedro Pans in the room, so welcome all, and descendants of Pedro Pan people, and people at the, the top. So going back to Dr. Tria, he earned his PhD and MA in history from Florida State University, and also holds a BA in history from the University of Florida. I guess when you went to school, you couldn't come to FIU because FIU was still uh, not offering these degrees. So anyway. I get one semester. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Tria has been a prolific and accomplished scholar. He has published several books and has several coming uh, soon. His most relevant publication is, of course, Fleeing Castro, Operation Pedro Pan and the Cuban Children's Program in 1991, which I think is one of the uh, classics in, in this field. He also published a book called Bay of Pigs, an oral history of Brigade 2506 in 2001, which received the Samuel Proctor History Prize by the Florida Historical Society. This book was later translated into Spanish, La Patria Nos Espera, La Invasión de Valle de Cochino, Relatada en la Palabra de la Brigada del Salto, 2506. And uh, he's also experimented with uh, fiction, historical fiction. He's written, I think, three. Well, it was a trilogy. So yes. Uh, published three, in 2013 and 14. And the title of that trilogy is called The Unbroken Circle. He also is the co author of a photographic history entitled The Cuban Revolution Years of Promise, 2005. And his most recent book will be published uh, this fall in September by the University of Puerto Florida. And the title is The Marielle Boatlift, A Cuban American Journey. Dr. Drea was born and raised in Miami. His parents left Cuba in 1960. Please help me welcome Dr. Victor. Okay, well, when Jorge wrote to me in, in January, we were going back and forth, and I said, well, well how long is the presentation? And he wrote, 30 to 45 minutes. Right? I have to have the email to prove it. Right? And then maybe two, three weeks later, they told me, you have to make a flyer, you know, say what you're going to talk about. And of course, I'd forgotten about my email with Honey. And I said, yeah, yeah, just put this and this and this and perfect. And then this week, uh, I said, okay, I have to get ready for this talk, right? Because uh, I, I was behind with everything. So, you know, I, I was hospitalized in Rome for a while. Um, and then I said, okay, so how long do I have? 45 minutes. All right, let me see the flyer, what I said I was going to talk about. I'm reading it. I said, I'm not going to do that in 45 minutes. <laughs> so Honey had maintenance uh, installed right above that panel. You can't see it, uh, but there's a bucket of ice water. In 45 minutes, it opens and it pours on me to tell me to stop talking. I don't talk very much anyway, those of you who know me. Uh, those are all just rumors about me talking too much. It's, just, it's you know, it's scandalous. Anyway, um, some people ask me how I, how I came to write this book. This is my first book. Uh, it, it was all very simple, like most things are. I wish I could tell some dramatic story, but... Uh, I was looking for a, a, a doctoral dissertation topic, and I was leaving my brother's house, and I was in his driveway, and it must have been 1993 or so, and he told me, uh, why don't you write it on Pedro Pan? And, I, and of course, my reaction was, what's that? Uh, and then he had some notes, but th th those were the years where all this was coming forward, right? Very few people had heard of, of the operation at that time. 
uh, Operation Pedro Pan group had been formed and they were, you know, getting some press and it was just starting to emerge in the media. And then I looked into it and there was no book written on it. Uh, there were several articles, pieces of other books. Uh, so I said, perfect, this is what I'll do. And, and so I wrote it as my dissertation and then, like I said, uh, I submitted to the University of Press of Florida after. Um, again, I was very young, I was what, 28 years old and kind of naive, and I said, well, you know, this is a story, you know, 14,000 kids, State Department, CIA, Catholic Church, Underground Railroad, who would be interested in that, right? Because when, when, when you're raised here, it's just like, like kind of part of the furniture, right, these stories, and, and you don't get an idea of how other people might view it, and of course, they got published, and, and, and it's been great. Um, ever since then, of course, there have been several other books written on Pedro Pan. How many are there now? There's just, I mean, yeah, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ton of them from, from all sides. Um, and again, I don't know if I had the fortune or the misfortune of being uh, the first one, but you know, the ones that came out later took a, let's just say it's a slightly different point of view uh, than I did. And, and well, they haven't, not everyone's been nice to me, but that's okay. Uh, I don't mind. Um, including uh, one published in, in Cuba by the Cuban government. Um, who, when I got the copies of the pages where I would, someone sent me copies, um, and it referred to me as uh, El Destacado Apologista. I said, okay, I, I understand that. And then they said, Que mantiene sus ataduras clasistas. I said, uh, hold on, so I called my father. Why me que una atadura clasista? I was brought up in Westchester, we didn't use words like that. Um, and, and he explained it to me. But then, you know, years and years went by, and I remember I, I was in my little town in Connecticut, right, um, at, at, at the local Catholic school, and they were welcoming a new principal who's from a remote corner of Connecticut, uh, and she meets me, and she says, oh, my daughter-in-law's marrying, you know, someone cute, and I go, really? Oh, that's great. And then she tells me, this is in 2012, okay, the book got published in 2001, right, oh, no, I'm sorry, 1998, I'm sorry. And then she says, have you ever heard of Operation Pedro Pan? She asked me. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I have. So the point is that someone there in, 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 a, in a remote corner uh, of Connecticut has heard of it now, right? When, when the, not, not because of me, mostly because of Operation uh, Pedro Pan group and, and, and all of the attention that it's gotten. So now it's become common knowledge. But 25 years ago, hardly anybody had heard of this. Anyway, so I'm gonna try to keep it uh, within the time limit. Notice I said try. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make an effort. So, so I guess the best places are I'm going to review. And by the way, this is only the second time I do a PowerPoint, right? Um, so if it's not perfect, I, I apologize. But that, it's not bad, though. Right? I mean, you know, it looks professional, I guess. Uh, but anyway, if, if we start in 1959, uh, we know that um, Batista is overthrown. Uh, on January 1st, and of course all the emotions that went with it. Some people were relieved, some people were joyful, some people feared, probably some wiser people said, well, everybody, there's a lot of euphoria, it can only go down from here, which is kind of what happened. But for people, it was a new freedom, they were gonna restore the Constitution of, of 1940, uh, et cetera. And there were a lot of groups that overthrew Batista, but of course the biggest and most prominent at that moment was the 26th of July movement, in part because the international media loved the 26th of July movement. They were just so interesting to look at, right? These, these rebels with beards and, and all of this. So there, 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 there was a lot of PR that they did which made the big, but we know very early, almost immediately, they said they were gonna postpone the promised elections. They were never held, abolished political parties, began holding show trials uh, for alleged uh, war criminals which didn't follow any uh, legal procedure at all. Executions being broadcast, right? You know, we, you know, we interrupt this program. Um, and, and a lot of people started getting a lot of bad feelings uh, about what was coming. Although Castro was surrounded by responsible liberals, you know, with democratic track records, but that proved to be a facade. Within the next several months, those liberals were purged from the government. Uh, Marxist commissars started to be sent to the army, right, uh, uh, trying to indoctrinate these soldiers in, into communism. Uh, known communists began rising to power, and there were warnings as early as July 1959 uh, Pedro de Lanz, who, who, who was the head of the Air Force and, and had supported Castro, was in front of the U.S. Congress saying, this is communist, which, of course, they didn't listen to him, uh, nor did the New York Times. Uh, oh, and Matos also in the summer and then later in the fall. But this, is, this is still 1959, right? So the, so the voices of warning were there. Radicalism was, was increasing, youth groups, etc. In other words, this was more than just um, a revolution. 
I mean, it almost seemed like it was a coup that had a lot more to it uh, than, than what they promised, and really very little of what they promised. Anyway, by 1960, many people were suspicious that, that this was going to be a communist revolution, that, 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 that somehow uh, it was a great manipulation, and it was. It was a great, it was tremendous sleight of hand, uh, subversion, uh, the whole thing, because nobody ever expected this to be communist, especially the people who supported it. Uh, in February, Anastas Mikoyan went to Havana, right, to, to attend the Soviet scientific uh, exhibit. There was the famous student protest, right, which was already an anti-communist protest, and this is already, this is only February 1960. After that, Cuba and the Soviet Union established uh, diplomatic relations, trade, etc., and for the next several months in 1960, um, uh, freedom of the press was abolished, sectors of the private economy were nationalized, professional associations were revolutionized, the university's autonomy was taken away, the independence of labor unions was, uh, was taken away, um, the, 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 the Catholic Church started to be harassed, uh, there was a crackdown on pro-democracy opponents, because by this time a lot of the people who had supported uh, Castro were now organizing uh, against him. Anyway, all of this and all the suspicions and everything that was coming is going to trigger a massive wave of people uh, leaving Cuba. Um, oh, thank you, Zoe. Yeah. Um, this first wave, of course, at first, in the first few months, were mostly a handful of Batista people, right, which you can't constitute as a wave. But throughout, by late 1959 and throughout 1960, it's now going to include a lot of people who either had nothing to do with politics, many people who had even been anti-Batista, uh, who were fleeing communism and were fleeing this totalitarian takeover. Some had left with the intention of going back to fight. Um, uh, others to wait it out. Many people didn't believe that Cuba could ever be communist and that the United States would allow it. Anyway, it, it's within that context, and I guess I'm addressing something here that I'm going to try not to address. I'll let you ask me to read. But, but it, it, you, you can't take Operation Pedro Pan and remove all the context from it, right, and say, we're going to focus on these 14,000 children who left, and put a microscope on it, and remove all the other context, as if those were the only people who were coming during that first wave. And that's simply not the case. There was general panic among a lot of parents for very good reasons and very true reasons. Parents were almost prophetic, right, to get their kids out of Cuba. And many families, entire families, left motivated by that, especially when, when, when they were going to close the uh, schools down. So probably countless thousands of families left Cuba to protect their children, right? Nobody will ever know that number, right? That same impulse, right, is why the Pedro Pan parents sent their children, right? The same fear. But for some reason, one reason or another, the parents of those 14,000 couldn't leave at that moment. Right? And, and there were a whole lot of reasons. They had relatives in prison. Um, they didn't have the documentation because the U.S. Embassy had closed in January 1961, and they had the chance to send their kids. Right? Half of those kids were sent to relatives in the United States. Right? And another large percentage of the parents were able to get out before they closed the flights. Right? And, and, and I guess you know, I, I'm indirectly uh, addressing this notion uh, that somehow um, all these parents were manipulated by the CIA, and there was all this big CIA campaign to put fear into parents, which of course implies, because what emerged was actually wonderful, right? And the only way anybody could fear what was going to happen in Cuba is if they were manipulated, right? I mean, how could they possibly, you know, be fearful of this wonderful thing, right? Which of course we know, which that's obviously not my point of view. Um, there were fears, there were real fears, especially for teenagers. Teenagers were targeted. Uh, there, there, there was fear of the draft, which eventually came. Uh, the, 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 the revolutionary organizations they were expected to become a part of, and espousing an ideology that most of these parents would find uh, offensive. Right? So it wasn't just that they had to join a group. And anybody who knows anything about Cuba, especially during this period, and especially starting in the mid-60s and on, was that the pervasiveness of the Cuban Revolution, or for the Castro Revolution, Right was 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 so profound that it, it wasn't just a restructuring of the island's economic system or education system. Right, it was totalitarian. It expected every individual to be on board uh, with the ideology, and that in turn uh, determined right your employment, right whether your children would be harassed in school, right whether you know when you turned 16 you were sent to a concentration camp, 
right? These are real stories. And let me tell you, probably the greatest, that would, would, what gave me a great perspective on Operation Pedro Pan was the book I just wrote, and that hopefully will come out in the fall, on the Mario Bolt lift, right? So well, well, what connection does the Mario Bolt lift have to Operation Pedro Pan? Well, it has a lot, because I got, because there, there, there's a category of Cuban exile, which, which only a few people know of, or, or, or know the word. There's Pedro Pan, but there's the Pedro Sin Pan, right? But, and, and those are the people who either fit the profile of a Pedro Pan, or actually had the documents from Monsignor Walsh when they closed the flights in 1962, right? A lot of those people, and, and by the way, 70% of Pedro Pans were teenage boys, right? Let's say you were 14 when they closed the flights in 1962, right? That's it, you couldn't get out until the Freedom Flights. Ah, but then they passed the Military Draft Act before the Freedom Flights. So when the Freedom Flights came, you were military age, which you were military age from 16 to 27 years of age. So they couldn't leave and the Freedom Flights ended. A lot of them had to end up coming on the uh, 1980 boat list. And I interviewed a lot of them, and a lot of them had been in concentration camps and the UMAP camps. It's, uh, these are people who fit the profile better, and many of which had documents for Operation Better Fund, but simply couldn't get out. So that's all I'm gonna say. If you wanna ask me about you know, the, what the parents saw, um, you know, why they sent the kids out, you can ask me during the question and answer. Right, but you know, there, there was also the issue of you know, patria potenta, right? Whether the parents were going to lose uh, uh, that 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 parental authority uh, over their children, and all people say, oh, well, yeah, but, but 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 that was just a rumor spread by the underground. That never happened. But patria potenta was taken away, uh, although indirectly in a de facto manner. When you can't determine how your children are going to be educated, when you can't determine whether your children are going to go to church or not, um, when 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 religious institutions are abolished. Uh, when, when, when your children are expected to be atheists, when, when, when the revolution expects you right, to be an ardent supporter, otherwise you may not be able to go to medical school or you may be harassed or you may be put in front of your classroom and, 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 and people criticize you when you're 12 years old. Um, uh, it's a, yeah, then it's taken away in a, in a de facto manner. There, there were fears that children would be sent to the Soviet Union in 1961, right at the height of all this, a thousand children were sent to the Soviet Union. Right? And of course, for the, but that wasn't the only fear, right? You can't stop there because for many par parents, the fear was maybe they're not going to be sent to the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union is going to be brought here, and that's what's going to emerge here. So anyway, more on that if you want to ask me during, during your question, because if not, I'll go on for the whole 45 minutes on that topic. Anyway, by the end of 1960, even before Pedro Pan started, there were around 60,000 human exiles in Miami. Local so social service agencies were overwhelmed. Miami wasn't the city it is today, right? I mean, anybody gives you an address in Miami from the early 60s, it's all way east, right? It's you know, maybe a few blocks inland, uh, and that was it. And so the social service world here wasn't very big. And of course, they were experiencing a lot of difficulties. Here we enter, I hope I do this right. Ah, good. All right, Father Brian Walsh, uh, born and raised in Ireland. Right, graduated from St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, Maryland, which was the first Catholic seminary in the United States uh, in 1954. And he was sent to Miami in 1957, just three years later, where, where he became the director of the Catholic Welfare Bureau, which was a local child care and adoption agency that at the time, while this was happening, had around 80 children uh, under its care. 80, right? It will soon be like 7,000 uh, in, in no time. The law couldn't imagine what was coming. But Walsh was alerted. In, in November of 1960, um, someone brought him a 15-year-old uh, uh, called uh, Pedro Menendez. He was brought to Walsh. Pedro's parents had sent him to Miami to get him away from the communist brainwashing, to get him away, uh, to get him out of trouble, because teenagers were getting in a lot of trouble. Remember, I mean, Cuba during that era, you were 14 years old, right? You could be you know, a major political activist, right? And so they sent him away. Uh, relatives couldn't care to him, went from home to home. He finally ended up homeless, lost 20 pounds, and they brought him to, to Father Walsh. And Walsh said, quote, it was a scared and hungry child that stood in my office that November afternoon. Now, Walsh, seeing everything that was happening around him, the other social service agencies, all these uh, refugees showing up, uh, was concerned that this issue of unaccompanied minors among the refugee population was eventually <coughs> going to grow. And of course, he was correct. To confirm this word came from Key West, that a family had showed up and asked the judge to find a home for their child while they fought Castro. Uh, in Cuba. Anyway, so Walsh already had this in mind in November of 1960. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, local leaders in Miami of the time uh, were very anxious about the arrival of so many refugees uh, in Miami. 
they saw it as a national problem. This is an immigration problem, this is a Cold War problem, whatever you want to call it. So they formed the Cuban Refugee Executive Committee. And that committee, the, the, the purpose was to petition President Eisenhower to give them guidance, federal assistance uh, concerning the refugee crisis, and especially the, what they wanted was the relocation of the refugees. You know, take them somewhere else, right? Not here. And as, and as a result of their actions, that today there's not a single Cuban in Miami. Uh, <laughs> you know, scattered all over the place. Anyway, uh, Eisen, President Eisenhower sent Tracy Voorhees to Miami, a special assistant. Voorhees had coordinated the Hungarian uh, refugee program. And so Voorhees came to Miami to, to, to listen to and to work with the Cuban Refugee Executive Committee. Um, Walsh heard of the Voorhees mission. Walsh heard that he was coming. So Walsh moved very quickly. He's a very young priest. Walsh must have been in his early 30s at the time. If he was older, he may not have done it. <laughs> because, you know, when you're very idealistic and have a certain amount of energy and optimism at that age. Uh, anyhow, um, so what Walsh did, Walsh called a meeting with the child care division of, of Miami's Welfare Planning Council. And that, that, that Welfare Planning Council identified needs and solutions in the social welfare field. In other words, Walsh was trying to get ahead of the curve here. He unveiled a plan to this welfare committee um, to care for unaccompanied Cuban refugee children should they arrive, right? And he believed, first of all, uh, that if they did, their religious heritage should be protected, whether they were Protestant, Jewish, Catholic. Federal money should be used, and licensed child care agencies should be used. Of course, his group approved his plan, they forwarded the plan to the Cuban Refugee Executive Committee to ask them to present it to Tracy Voorhees coming down when, when he came down from Washington. Of course, Voorhees came, he reviewed the situation in Miami, the administration agreed to provide a million dollars uh, to alleviate the refugee crisis in Miami. They opened the Cuban Refugee Center in December. But on the children, um, the answer was, well, if, because there were no children at the time, there, there were no unaccompanied minors yet. He said, if, if the problem of dependent children re gets to the point where it's beyond the ability of local uh, child care agencies to, to deal with, and then you'll get the money, right? So there's a promise of money should this exceed the ability of, 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 of the local agencies. Anyhow, meanwhile, in Havana, while all this is going on, and completely unbeknownst to Walsh at that moment, um, there was in fact a plan to get children off the island, right? And here we enter. Mr. James Baker. Uh, Mr. Baker was the headmaster of Ruston Academy. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Ruston Academy. Uh, Baker had lived in Cuba for years. Um, he, he was very connected to the island. Um, I remember when, when I asked him, uh, he died many years ago, you know, why did you do what you did, right? Because I mean, he's really the one that got Pedro Pan started and saving Cuban children and all of that. And his answer to me, and, and I'll never forget, and I, and I wrote it down, he says, I was Cuban. Cuba was home. Castro was that in my home. Right? And he really felt Cuban. His children were raised in Cuba, right? And, and, and it was home for him. Ruston Academy was home. And um, when Batista was overthrown, of course, he was euphoric, but very soon was disillusioned with the changes and, of course, becoming communism. So Baker got connected to one of the groups in the Cuban underground, I forget which one, um, through his Ruston Academy family. Um, and a lot of underground operatives at that time Right, we're talking already late 1960, right? The, the uh, uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, was, or what became the Bay of Pigs invasion, was being planned. A lot of it depended, according to the plan, the original plan, on the underground inside of Cuba. And a lot of people said, well, I'll participate, but I don't want my children here, right? Because then they're, they come looking for me, they don't find me, they go after my children, they hold them hostage, right? And so Mr. Baker left Cuba, came to Miami with the intention first to get money from the former corporate heads in Cuba, right, who are waiting to go back of, of, of U.S. companies, right, and to find a boarding school or find a facility to open a boarding school, right, for these, these 200 or so children of underground operatives in Cuba. Again, he got the money, he didn't know what he was going to look for, he didn't, you know, he just came to see what he could do. While he was in Miami, someone told him, uh, you know, you should talk to Father Walsh, he, he's been dealing with this issue. And so Baker, met with Walsh. Um, Walsh suggested to Baker, told him, to drop this idea of a boarding school. He said, because first of all, it, it's a lot harder than you think, and plus you got the issue of year-round care and total universal care 
to boarding school doesn't do. He told them about the federal money that had been promised if unaccompanied children arrived. He told them of his plan to care for them should they arrive, uh, and that it would all be licensed child care agencies, and that their religious heritage would be protected. And of course, Baker was just thrilled. I mean, he was just incredibly impressed and amazed. And he said, great, so Walsh had solved half of Baker's problem. So the deal was, if Baker sent any kids over, right, Walsh would take them in, right? And the, and the program was set, the promise of money was there, the outline was there, etc. And this is gonna, so already the groundwork for the Cuban Children's Program, which is what Walsh did, right, with, with, with the whole plan um, that I uh, talked about a few minutes ago. And of course, now the Pedro Pan component comes in. Of course, at this point, it was all just theoretical, right? Nothing had happened yet. But, but, but Walsh's role was expanding. Walsh's expectation would be that he would be in his office and that he would start getting calls. Hey, there, there's an unaccompanied Cuban minor. Uh, you, know, you know, can we send him to you? Right? So in other words, take care of these kids as he became aware of them. But now this all changed. Now he's actually working with somebody inside of Cuba, right, who's sending them out, right? And Walsh would be meeting them at the point of entry at Miami International Airport. So it did change significantly, right? And so 200 kids or so uh, were on the initial list. And it wasn't just the children of underground operatives. It was open from the beginning to anyone who was concerned about their kids and, and, and could somehow get them out. Uh, of course, 200 would soon turn into 14,000. Um, anyhow, the original plan was very simple. Again, remember, the U.S. Embassy was open in Havana still. Um, commercial flights lasted, you know, until October 1962. So the plan was to get the, the, the kids out on student visas, right? Walt sent the letter to the U.S. Embassy in Havana saying that the Catholic Welfare Bureau would accept responsibility to the people that James Baker designated, right? Baker from Cuba would send Walsh the lists of students. Walsh would get visa, student visas for them through Coral Gables High School, right? And then send those visas uh, to Cuba. And money would come from those businessmen that I, that I mentioned earlier. So Baker went back to Cuba, and two days later sent to Walsh, or, or, or sent Walsh uh, a list with 125 names, right? And said, they can arrive anytime, <laughs> right? And of course, Walsh really didn't have anywhere to put them. Um, he had faith. Right, and that's gonna you know really make a difference. Um, and everyone thought that Castro on January first was gonna make an announcement that would prohibit children from leaving Cuba. So they were working under that pressure um, uh, uh, as well. Um, but Walsh didn't know if all the 125 were gonna show up at once. I mean, all they had the Catholic Welfare Bureau that I know of was St. Joseph's Villa, where they could put 10 to 12 kids. But the other ones he had no room for. It. And then he got the idea that Assumption Academy, right, which is an all-girls boarding school, uh, there on, on, on Brickle, right, um, uh, that its students were on vacation for Christmas, and it was empty. So Father Walsh went, he talked to Mother Elizabeth, and he asked her if they could use it if these kids showed up, and she said yes. Uh, and so he had a place. And so on Christmas 1960, Walsh uh, and Louise Cooper from the Catholic Welfare Bureau went to go wait for the flight from Cuba, not knowing if there'll be kids or not on the flight. It was just a matter of waiting. And Walsh said, quote, by this time, we ourselves had become emotionally involved in the race against the January 1st deadline. No longer were we simply a social agency concerned about a community problem. We were now sharing the worries of families we did not even know, hundreds of miles away in a life and death struggle in the Cold War. Our excitement rose as the time grew near for the first of the flights to arrive. Uh, Anticlimactically, there were no kids on those flights that day, but, but Walsh did work out arrangements with the uh, 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 local immigration officials, the Miami International officials, right, that, that would prove beneficial later. Uh, the next day, on December 26, several requests came to Walsh uh, from people in Miami who were already caring for kids and couldn't care for them to see if they could uh, send them into the program, but Walsh decided to wait until a kid was actually met at the airport. And the first one showed up later that day on the last flight, a brother and sister, Sixto uh, and Vivian Aquino. By December 31st, 22 more children were taken under care. Two days earlier, on, on December 29th, Father Walsh had concluded that the number of refugee children had reached that point beyond which uh, local agencies could handle and formally uh, requested the federal funds. But interesting, none of the students had come on the student visas. Walsh sent all the student visas there. And they came with other types of visas, other paperwork, which was fine. But finally, James Baker called Walsh, which he wasn't supposed to. They were supposed to communicate only via the diplomatic pouch. But he, he said, listen, the embassy's holding up the visas. You need to call Frank Auerbach at the State Department. 
right? So Walsh called Auerbach, uh, who, who was the head of the visa office, and Auerbach told Father Walsh on the phone that, that, that the letter he sent to the embassy wasn't enough, that he needed someone to accept ultimate responsibility. The words in the letter had to be different. And so Walsh, without consulting the bishop or anyone else, Walsh was I mean, practically a newly ordained priest, I didn't have time, so he gave it, he sent it, special delivery, remember special delivery, right, day before email, uh, you know, to uh, Washington. Um, and that was that. Um, a few days, well, January 1st came, there was no edict from the government that prohibited children leaving, but a few days later, uh, Cuba and the United States severed uh, diplomatic relations. In other words, as far as immigration was concerned, the way it impacted that, with the embassy closed, there was no way for people to get visas, at least not by conventional means, right? With the embassy closed, you simply could. So the whole idea of the student visas at that point ended. Uh, James Baker left Cuba after the embassy closed. He came to Miami as far as and Father Walsh was concerned. Well, that's it, you know? Well, you know, we got you know a couple dozen kids out, that's good. But what he didn't know is that Mr. Baker had formed a secret committee in Havana uh, with the means to continue getting children out. And remember, a key to all of this, to the whole first wave, which ended with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the absolute key is that commercial flights were still operating between Cuba and the United States. That's kind of what makes the first wave different, right? When people left, they came on Pan American, right? They came on KLM, right? Uh, because those flights didn't end until October 1962. Um, anyhow, this secret committee, which I'll list the people later, uh, were connected, uh, first of all, to the British Embassy, and secondly, to the Dutch Embassy in Havana. The idea was, a pretty creative idea, the British Embassy is open, so we could get these, these children visas to Jamaica, which, were the, which was a British possession, right? And we could take them on KLM, which was, which was the Dutch uh, national airline, um, again, which they had strong connections to, which I'll talk about later exactly what they were. So the idea was to send the kids out of Cuba on, 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 on British visas to Jamaica. There were two flights to Kingston. One went Havana, Kingston, right, directly. If they were on that flight, right, the kids would get off the plane in Kingston, right, they would stay in Kingston for the night, then get U.S. visas there, then come to Miami. If the other flight went Kingston, Miami, Havana, and if they were on that, of course, when they got to Miami, they just get out of the airplane, right, and that would be it. Anyway, um, well, of course, you needed permission for all of this. Um, so Walsh called, again, Frank Auerbach, the same guy at the State Department, uh, to talk about this. And Walsh was going to be in Washington, D.C. Um, for a White House conference on the aging anyway. So Auerbach told him, well, why don't you stop by the State Department on Sunday, and we'll meet you there. And of course, Washington was deserted. All the offices were deserted. It was all very mysterious uh, when Walsh went. And Walsh gets to uh, Washington. On this, on this very windy um, and overcast Sunday afternoon. Um, and he tells our back about the Jamaica plan. State Department approves it, although they had to have higher authorization from the British government. But then our back raised the possibility, and this is where we really get to the heart of this aspect of it, of visa waivers, right? Visa waivers. Anybody who came from Cuba in the early 1960s that heard the word visa waivers, right? Um, and it was actually multifaceted. Visa waivers were supposed to be used in extreme emergencies only. But there was no set limit of how many you could issue. And so the US government saw that loophole, and Cubans could continue to leave Cuba, even though the embassy was closed, if someone sent them a visa waiver. That is a waiving of the visa requirement, which is an actual letter. And all the, most of the Cubans, or at least a lot of them, who left on the first wave after uh, the embassy closed, came with visa waivers, right? Which, you know, someone of a first degree relative here had to ask for, you know, pay a certain amount of money, send it to Cuba, etc. That was starting to become a reality. But what they offered Walsh was something very different, right? They, they, they allowed Walsh's agency, the Catholic Welfare Bureau, to petition the State Department for visa waivers for Cuban minors between the ages of 6 and 18 and justify the visas because of the threat of communist indoctrination. Of course, with a visa waiver in Cuba, the kids could go buy an airplane ticket, then get on a flight and leave, right? Of course, there were questions. Would the Cuban government accept those as exit documents? Um, uh, would the Justice Department approve of this? So basically that day, Walsh was waiting. 
right, would the British approve the Jamaica plan and would the Justice Department approve the visa waivers? In the meantime, Walsh uh, called Jamaica, called the Archdiocese there, told them what might happen, um, got the cooperation of the Archdiocese there, and later in the day, the British approved the Jamaica plan and the Justice Department approved the visa waiver plan. But the visa waiver plan was extraordinary because it wasn't the same visa waivers that adults got. It was completely different, right? Father Walsh was given blanket authority to issue these visa waivers, typed on Catholic Welfare Bureau letterhead, right? On his letterhead, to any child between six and eight, and six and 18, those 16 to 18 had to be uh, a security check, right? Walsh sent, um, well, around 12 of these into Cuba, right? And you're know, perfect at all, but with the name blank, right? So that when they were distributed, all you had to do was fill in the kid's name, right? And that was it. And Walsh's signature was photocopied. Well, I guess it wasn't photocopied at the time, but it, uh, copies were made by underground printers, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of them inside of Cuba. Um, Baker, meanwhile, gave the okay to his committee that the Jamaica plan was a go, and so now uh, it really begins. Within days, Walsh began receiving children uh, with visa waivers at Miami International, and the first group made it to Jamaica. Of course, a lot more kids will come on visa waivers than through Jamaica, right? It was a lot simpler. Anyway, within Cuba, of course, the challenge became, right, to get these kids the visa waiver. And that wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part was getting a seat on an airplane, right, because that's, that, that's what was in uh, limited supply. So there was, I, I can't go through it all, obviously, but there were several networks uh, that were established to distribute visa waivers. Uh, the underground groups uh, distributed them. Uh, they were delivered en masse to Catholic schools. But of course, the Catholic schools are going to close in the spring of 1961. Pedro Pan's going to go on until October 1962. Uh, to Catholic parishes, to local clergy, to former politicians, right? There were all sorts of places you could get these visa waivers. And that wasn't the only way, though. Like I said, there were the Jamaica visas. There were also phony visas to third countries, right? There were some people involved in Pedro Pan who became experts at making uh, visa stamps, right? Um, and sometimes with the cooperation of foreign embassies and people in there. There was also another interesting way. Um, so in, in, in all cases, you didn't actually have to have the visa waiver, right? Someone in the United States could have gotten a visa waiver for you and put it on file with the airline at Miami International Airport, right? The airline at Miami International Airport, Pan Am, KLM, would then send a little card to their offices in Havana, right? And say, uh, Jose Lopez has a visa waiver on file at Miami International Airport, right? And then the people in Havana would give a letter saying, such and such has a visa waiver in Miami. That was enough to get out, right? So all you had to have was an acknowledgement that there was a visa waiver waiting for you in Miami. Of course, there were many cases, and I know someone well uh, who did this, someone I've known my whole life, who worked, I think, for KLM, um, who wrote a lot of those letters that, you know, Furano let that have the visa waiver in Miami when there wasn't one, right? And, of course, this was all part of the effort. This was all coordinated, right? It wasn't just that person doing it arbitrarily. Anyhow, um, at this point, the tickets cost $25. At first, they relied on those business people, but then eventually people simply started sending money uh, from Cuba, relatives in the United States. There were donations given to Walsh. Anyway, just to cover a few of the individuals, um, that Baker group, that original Baker group, that five-person committee that he left in charge of Havana early on, uh, you had two couples, um, uh, Francisco and, Ber and uh, Finlay and his wife, uh, Berta de la Portilla. Uh, Pancho Finlay, was the head of KLM uh, for Cuba and the Caribbean. In fact, a, it, it, his grandfather right, was, was, was the one who discovered the cause of yellow fever in Cuba. And I think there's a school right here named for his grandfather, right, right off the FIU campus. Uh, anyhow, they were, they were connected to Russ, and Pancho was the head of KLM um, uh, in the region. He secured spaces on, on, on flights uh, for the children and for a lot of adults, too. He approved a lot of you know the notes that were sent, et cetera, saying people had uh, uh, visa waivers uh, in Miami. Uh, he, was con he, he was connected to the British Embassy. Uh, he and his wife uh, distributed uh, numerous visa waivers uh, to private schools, to the underground network. He coordinated with Pan Am. And I saw one number where that couple is credited um, with 85,000 children uh, to leave Cuba. Uh, Sergio and Serafina, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Sergio Hiquel and Serafina Lastra 
also a married couple, friends of Baker's and involved since the beginning, running messages between Havana and Miami, distributing visa waivers, etc. And maybe one of the more interesting was Penny Powers. Penny Powers was British. Um, she was connected to the British Embassy. Uh, she taught English at Ruston Academy. She had been involved in the effort to get Jewish children out of Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II. Uh, and of course was very involved in distributing visa waivers, in being the contact person with the British Embassy, in smuggling underground operatives out of Cuba who were, who were uh, being pursued, um, and used her private school network also to distribute these visa waivers. Um, a lot of people were involved throughout, but you also had a lot of the other people involved with Pedro Pan. A lot of the underground networks uh, fell apart after the Day of Pigs invasion. Right? There were some still operating, but a lot did. And remember, three things happened at once that are really going to affect Pedro Pan. Okay? Uh, um, um, first of all, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion failed. Right around the same time, within weeks, they closed all the private schools and all the schools in Cuba, period. And of course, Castro declared himself to be socialist, which in the context of the day, he was admitting to being a communist, because in December, he's going to declare himself a Marxist-Leninist. Anyhow, but other people did get involved. Probably the most prominent uh, were uh, Mongo Grau and his sister, Polita. They were the niece and nephew of, of, of a former president of Cuba. Uh, they, Polita joined through Penny Powers, who she knew. Um, and after the Bay of Pigs invasion, they got very involved. Uh, they had a large political network. They were both connected to the underground. They had a little bit more freedom since their uncle, right, was still very popular, still very prominent, and for the moment, not that the regime wouldn't have imprisoned him, but they still had to be a little careful with popular political figures. That's going to end, right? Because uh, both uh, Mongo and Polito will go to prison um, in 1965, and, and, and Polito will be in prison until 1979, and Mongo until 1986. And beyond this, there were hundreds and hundreds of people, former diplomats, teachers, clergy, a lot of people whose names uh, we'll never know who were involved in this end of the operation. Every now and then, you know, one meets people and they've never heard of them. And then you find out they played this enormous role. Now, as far as the Cuban Children's Program was concerned, uh, like I said, the basic outline was there. Uh, in early 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy becomes president. He sent the secretary of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, Abraham Rivikoff, to Miami. Uh, this was different. Eisenhower had sent the special representative. Kennedy sending the head of Health, Education, and Welfare. Ribikoff reported back to Kennedy, um, and basically, within that context, created the Cuban Refugee Program, which was a very large, comprehensive uh, program. And point number eight stated of, of, the, of the bullet point part of it, uh, to provide aid for the care and protection of unaccompanied children, the most defenseless and troubled among the refugee population. Right? And of course, that laid the groundwork for the, for the, um, uh, the this report laid the groundwork for the Cuban Refugee Program. Walsh had met with Secretary Ribikoff during his visit, and they spoke of tying Walsh's program, which had already started, right, to the larger Cuban Refugee Program. That would make funding a lot more secure, it would make it a part of something much larger, and that would be good for the program. Anyhow, they did, they did, and the way it worked, um, the federal government, right, using uh, HEW, right, the, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, they used the Children's Bureau of HEW. They concluded a contract with the Florida State Department of Public Welfare, and the Florida State Department of Public Welfare would be the agent for the, for the Federal Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to contract lo, uh, local agencies. So the, the, the Florida Department contracted uh, the private agencies that would actually provide the care for the children. Um, of course, the vast, overwhelming majority were Catholic, and so the biggest agency was Walsh's Catholic Welfare Bureau. There was also the Children's Service Bureau for Protestant children. There were around 700 Protestants. Uh, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation and the United Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society uh, for Jewish children. I think it was like 396 Jewish children or so around there. So anyway, the private agencies would provide the actual care. Custody would remain with the parents in Cuba. Um, and Walsh's three goals were met. Uh, the children's religious heritage was protected. Licensed organizations would provide care, and public money uh, would be used. And it all happened in the nick of time, because this was in the spring of 1961, right? After the Bay of Pigs invasion, Pedro Pan skyrocketed, right? I mean, I don't even think it was in, it was in the hundreds in, in, in April 1961. Again, it just started in December. 
But after the invasion and the panic that emerged after the failure, right, is, 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 is really going to make this thing explode. It's going to go from a few hundred to 14,000. Um, the, the program went through a lot of phases. I don't have time um, to go through it all because actually the Cuban Children's Program will last until 1981, long after the Pedro Pan kids were gone. So the Cuban Children's Program was started because of Operation Pedro Pan, and all of the initial children in it were Pedro Pan, but they continued to accept children for years, even after, it, even, even after the uh, Pedro Pan children had left. Anyhow, but in these early years, in the years of uh, Pedro Pan, the Catholic Welfare Bureau uh, met uh, the children at Miami International Airport, right? The children were all told to ask for George, right? Um, George Wash, well, there's Miami International and some of the kids arriving. Right, some pictures from Operation Pedro Pan Group. I have to credit it for copyright reasons. <laughs> Courtesy of Operation Pedro Pan Group. Right, and there's a picture of, of George Wash. Um, and all the kids were asked, they were told to ask for George. They had no idea who George was, but they were told to ask for him. And of course, George worked uh, for the Catholic Welfare Bureau, volunteering to, to, uh, to uh, 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 meet the children, were, uh, report the arrival, organize transportation to the camps. Like I said, about half the children had relatives waiting for them at the airport, and they went with them. So not every child who came Operation Federal Bank entered the Cuban Children's Program, about half of them did. Uh, there they were transported to one of the transit centers, right? There were three camps that had been established, um, which started out as camps and became transit centers. So there were so many th thousands of children arriving, they couldn't hold its kids at, at these camps. So Walsh had to work out uh, arrangements uh, through the National Conference of, of uh, Catholic Charities and dioceses around the United States. Ninety-five licensed Catholic child care agencies in over 35 states participated. Walsh had to get them there. Whether they were foster homes, boarding schools, orphanages, often for teenage boys, they, they would send a group of teenage boys with Cuban clergy who were exiled. Some, you know, diocese in, in some other part of the country say, well, we have a building and, you know, that could hold 10 boys. They would send them there uh, with um, Cuban clergy. Um, so, the, so the camps initially acted as these uh, transit centers. Again, at the camp, sometimes there were relatives in Miami who came and took them. Uh, but at the height of the program, like I said, they were temporary shelter. And of course, the kids waiting to get their becas, right? That's what they called them, which were permanent placements elsewhere in the country, whether it was with a foster home or wherever it might have been. And again, a lot of the parents framed this as they're going to go study in the United States, right? They're, they're leaving Cuba and we're sending them into an educational situation. So that was so deeply ingrained, again, that the, that the kids at the camps called their permanent placements becas, right? But those were simply just uh, those placements. Anyway, at the height of the program, there were three camps. There was the Kendall camp, which was the only camp in the beginning, but when it grew, they had opened two more. Eventually, Kendall was used to house boys between the age of 12 and 14. Uh, camp Matecumbe then was opened to house boys 15 to 18. And the Florida City Camp, which was a, which was a series of garden-style uh, apartments, which you saw in the beginning in the opening picture, which were all the girls and boys to the age of 12. Oh, thank you. Um, for teenage boys, the, the teenage boys were the hardest ones to place. I don't know why. Um, anyway, um, so a couple of home permanent homes were opened in Miami for teenage boys. Again, Matecumbe became a transit center. Later, after Pedro Pan ended, there was more of a sense of permanence to it, but for the moment, it was a transit center. But they did open uh, two homes. Uh, Walsh hoped that by opening these homes, especially the one that he had, the kids could live in a home environment, they could go to school, they could work part-time, and also as a showcase, right, for Catholic welfare workers in other dioceses who would visit Miami, visit these places, get inspired, and maybe offer Walsh use of a, of a facility in their diocese. Um, the first one was St. Uh, St. Rayfield's. Well, I'm sorry, there's the Kendall camp there that I just mentioned. Right, that's Camp Matacumbe, which is on 137th Avenue, is it? Mm -hmm. Right, somewhere around Sunset Miller area, which was which was the woods back then. 137th, it was 137th Avenue at 90, 90 something. Okay, so 90 something. 120th. 120. Just, okay. The right. Okay. Right. Right. Tamiami Airport, which were the woods back then, in the middle of the Everglades. Then, there's a Florida City camp, like I said, the garden-style apartments. 
and St. Raphael's. Now, Walsh lived at St. Raphael's. He was, he, was, he was the head of the home. Um, also, uh, they opened uh, White Hall, which was, well, there's another St. Raphael's picture. They opened White Hall, and White Hall was run uh, by the Jesuits. Of course, we know Belen, with all the other private schools, had been closed. Uh, the Jesuits were here. They'd opened Belen here, and a lot of their former students were on a company here. And so they opened White Hall, you know, as a as a as a group home, uh, mostly for kids who were attend, who were unaccompanied and going to Belen at that time. Um, later, they they opened the uh, Jesuit Boys uh, residence. Anyhow, uh, eventually, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis came. The number of people leaving Cuba declined uh, substantially, and there wasn't that pressure anymore, right? That we have to place these kids out of town. And so the tendency to send them out of Miami um, was kind of reduced. These camps became a little bit more permanent, you know, without that pressure. After, uh, afterward, um, in 1962, the county requested the return of the Kendall camp, which belonged to Dade County. Uh, Walsh had arranged for the kids to stay at the Marine Barracks in Opelaka, uh, at, at the Opelaka Airport. And again, then the missile crisis came, so there was a delay. So, so the boys at Kendall were moved there in 1963. Um, later, the Jesuits from the Je uh, Jesuit boys' residence were also told to move uh, those boys to Opelaka. Um, later, St. Raphael's, and um, I'm sorry, St. Raphael's was closed in, in 1964, and all the boys were also sent uh, to Opelaka. Florida City wasn't closed until 1965. Uh, and then the remaining girls there were moved to a home on US-1 when it remained there until 1981. Um, when the freedom flights came, starting in 1965, thousands of these kids were reunited with their parents. By mid-1966, there were only around 500 or so children still under care nationwide, and only a small percentage at the Miami centers. Of course, Opelaka was way too big for the number of boys that remained. So in the summer of 1966, the remaining boys were moved to a home on Southwest 8th Street near Brickell Avenue uh, under the care of a single Jesuit priest uh, from Belen. And then in 1970, what remained was moved to a small building uh, once used as a hotel on Biscayne and 114th in Miami Shores. By, by then, there were 30 boys or so, uh, and that was it. And again, but none of them you know, were forced to leave until they were 18. And Walsh made sure that when the program ended, all the boys uh, were over 18. Of course, by that time, by the 1970s, uh, most of the, you know, the people who were in the Cuban Children's Program were no longer better the fight because they had out outgrown that. But it, like I said, the Cuban Children's Program continued to accept unaccompanied Cuban minors, right? That, that, that came in and, and they did so until 1981. Okay, I think my 45 minutes are <laughs> So anyway, um, so I'm gonna open it up uh, to any and all questions. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, okay, so who had, okay, go ahead. It's actually, we're going to take questions from both ways. Oh, okay. Two microphones. <laughs> so, this, really, the operation really takes uh, life. Do I get my Good afternoon.